Kim, another snowy, wet, kind of rainy, cool day today. I shouldn't complain all the time. It's just late winter, early spring. But the thing that just fires me off is that maple's in full bloom out there. And I know that my bees don't have access to the pollen and sometimes the nectar that maple provides. So I'm anxious. Yeah, I'm looking out the window and I can see you talk about those maple buds. They're covered with snow right now. You know, we talk all the time about the nectar flow. We worry about the nectar flow. We get ready for the nectar flow. But are you ready for your pollen flow? (laughs) I'm not sure. (laughs) Let's talk about it for a few minutes. Hi, I'm Jim Tew. And I'm Kim Flatham. And I want to see if Kim and I can spend some time today giving the pollen flow a more fair shake than it usually gets. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, Sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. Kim, I always think, I always talk, I always prepare for the nectar flow. And I want to confess, when I realize that the bees have a decent pollen flow going on, I always feel good about it because that makes me think that I'm going to have a good nectar flow. So the pollen flow always lives in the shadow of the nectar flow. Is that right or wrong? Uh, I think you're probably more right than wrong on that one because, well, two things. When I look when I look at a, a busy spring brood nest, and there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's uncapped brood and there's capped brood, and up in the corners there's nectar, not yet honey, maybe some honey, but that pollen ring that goes between the, brood circle in the middle and the honey in the corners just never explodes. It's just always kind of the same or less. Yep. And that's weird, isn't it? Because the bees, you'd, I would think if I were a bee that I would that I would be just as eager for pollen, the bee's protein source, as I would for nectar, the bee's carbohydrate source. But yet the bees seem to preferentially go for the honey. Is that too anthropomorphic, <laughs> too humanistic? Is that just me? Well, you know, one thing I don't know, and you'd think as long as you and I have been at this, we'd have a good feel for this, but once pollen comes back to the hive and the forager kicks it off and the, the house bee takes it and puts it someplace, how long does it last? How, no, how long is it good? And and that may be why there isn't yeah. much. I don't know. Yep, I, I don't know why. Why can you find honey in all these bizarre stories? I just read that honey was found that was five thousand five hundred years old. They didn't find any pollen five thousand five hundred <laughs> years old. So I don't think it has the same shelf life as as honey. And I think that in that regard, the bees lucked out that honey is so stable, but pollen seems to be, I'm out on thin ice here now, but it seems to almost begin to decline in quality about as quickly as they store it, and it certainly declines over time. Have you seen those old pollen frames, you know, that are a year or two old? It's like the bees give up. They don't try to clean it out. They don't try to throw it out. It's just like they'll put a light capping over it and just work around it. And I guess it's of no value at all to them, and it's just too hard to clean up. And, and eventually it's abandoned. Or is it? Yeah. Do they, you know, they don't They don't clean it out right away because they're busy collecting nectar. But will they clean it out next October when they're done collecting nectar for the winter? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. it's because I've never I, looked. I, I, uh, I got to rush to say I don't know. While you were saying that, that pollen that you know that 
that pollen, once it's stored and mixed with honey and saliva, becomes this partially fermented product called bee bread that apparently has a, a more digestible characteristic than just straight pollen. That, that stuff gets hard. It gets really, you know, like cement, hardens up. Can, can those, do those bees have the mouth parts? Because bees are usually drinking more than they're yeah. eating. Yeah. We say they eat pollen. But they they don't really have mouth parts that are designed to eat. They have to put everything in some kind of slurry or liquid. You I got you got me. I don't know if if bees can really go back to that old pollen and do anything with it or not. But why we got down this rabbit hole was because you said correctly, I think, that this stuff doesn't store indefinitely the way nectar does. So bees seem to be kind of taking it for the moment. And a big expression of that is if I just say the word robbing, I bet you every listener out there will know immediately what robbing is. But let me ask you and those listeners, are you think they're robbing pollen? No. So I've never understood why not. Why weren't they in there if they're pilfering their neighbor's stores, why didn't they take the pollen too? And, and my guess, before you shoot me down, my guess is that there's just not a ready way to, to put toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> they can't get that pollen out of the cell and put it back in their pollen basket, their corbicula, the way they did when they collected it at the flower. Now, I'm finished. You shoot holes in that. Well, I go back to that ring of pollen that's sitting around the edge of the brood nest underneath the corners where the honey is. And I'm wondering, does the pollen come in there right next to the brood nest? And it sits there, and they use it as they need it. But does some of that pollen either stay there and get mixed with honey on top and then capped? Or get moved someplace and mixed with honey and capped? Maybe I'm looking at what I thought was capped honey. And it's really capped bee bread, or what? Now you got me thinking. The only time I've seen anything that I knew was capped pollen seemed to be pollen that a bit ago you called abandoned. Because when I would gouge down to it and gouge through that, I don't know, it wasn't wax cappings. It was just kind of a layer of hardened pollen. It looked like pollen underneath. So I, I don't know if it had lost its value or if it had some tox, natural toxicity to it or if pesticide contamination. And do the bees have the brain power to realize that and cap over it, to ostracize it, to contain it? Well, what happens when you put a pollen patty on a colony? <laughs> God, what are you trying to do? Cold me underwater here? I can't keep up with you on these unanswerable questions. Take a break. And uh, let's hear from our sponsor who has Pollen Sources supplemental products available to you. We're thinking spring here at Better Bee. Do you have all the hive bodies and frames you need to super up your hives or expand your apiary? If not, we have you covered with high quality woodenware made by our sister company, Humble Abodes. Humble uses eastern white pine from the backwoods of Maine to manufacture box joints that are guaranteed to fit together tightly and frame parts that are easily assembled. Give us a call to learn more about any of our products or to ask a beekeeping question. We've got you covered. Shop for wooden boxes and frames at betterbee.com slash wood. All right, let me go back. You got me backed up about three or four questions here. They're putting that ring of pollen right close to the brood because you said that it takes about a cell of pollen to produce one bee. You, I've heard you say that. So you going to stay with that right now? Well, a cell of pollen and a cell of honey. A cell of pollen and a cell of honey to produce a bee. All right. And adults need pollen, too. Throughout their lives, they need pollen. And adults don't carry a lot of food reserves. So they're basically like teenagers. They're eating all the time, a little bit. Just a steady, kind of a steady process of eating all the time. So if they come across pollen that they're not 
happy with, got too old, they sense has no nutritive value. I guess they just abandon it. I guess they leave it. I guess they don't know that they cap it over with wax. They might move it. They might not. I think you and I agreed that we didn't know what they did with that. But it, we do agree that it has no nutritive value. So there's that. What about a pollen patty? I spent a lot of time with those things. When I was in graduate school at Maryland, there were scientists at the USDA working with brewer's yeast and various simple concoctions that you could make your own pollen patty because none were available. And I suppose that that and other work around the world was the foundation for developing these pollen patties that you can, that you can readily buy. I, I, I love that stuff. So since nectar and the ease of which we can mimic nectar by using sugar syrup was not the same with protein, beekeepers today really have it made in that you can just put a pollen patty on if you think that your bees don't have the pollen flow coming in. So, yes, I use pollen patties if that's where you were going, and I use them eagerly. I buy the far more than I can need, use, and then I freeze it. And then the day I need a pollen cake or a patty, I get it out of the freezer, let it sit for a while, then take it out. I've often sensed, Kim, that the bees are not crazy about this stuff, that they're eating it, as it were, more because it's in the way. I've got it right sunk in the middle of their brood nest. And I don't know that they're eating because they just love it or because they're just trying to clean the hive up. Help me with that. Yeah, good question. I'll throw something else out here about a pollen patty. Ask you a question. Have you ever put a pollen trap on a colony and a pollen patty on the same colony at the same time to see what happens to the pollen patty? And you can do this, you know, you got two colonies. One you put a pollen trap and a pollen patty on, and one you don't put a pollen trap on, and and you put the pollen patty on it, and you just, you know, measure the difference. Measure the difference in brood production oh, or what? Or what? Uh, you know, how— how, yeah. how Productivity? Yep. How, far, how fast does that pollen patty disappear? How much brood is raised? How much of that pollen patty gets stored? Does it any get stored? A pollen patty gets stored in that ring of pollen around the around the brood. Yeah, I thought they. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think of any way to respond to that. I feel like I'm taking an oral exam here today. <laughs> uh, I've no no number one. I put pollen traps on. Yes, a uh, lots of times. And secondly, I put pollen patties on. Yes, lots of times. But I don't recall ever intentionally putting a pollen patty on a colony that I had a pollen trap on to see anything. And in my defense, I was either putting on the patty or either putting on the trap for specific reasons. And I was not trying to combine those reasons to see if I, if what, if the patty was taken faster, slower, more bees, more brood, fewer bees. No, I've never done that. I hope you have. I have it. Well, back before small hive beetle, way back before small hive beetle, we looked at that and tried to figure out what was going on with, this was right in the beginnings of pollen patties. This is back when I was working USDA, way back when. And we were looking at pollen patties with and without pollen traps, and we never come up with an answer, but it was, the behaviors were different. Between the colonies, the colonies with the pollen traps took some of the some of the pollen patty, but not not all of it. The colonies without the pollen traps didn't take as much, but they took some. So they were eating both, just depending on more pollen or more pollen patty on whether they were at getting pollen. And that's as far as I ever got with that. I, have, I haven't looked since. Does that make any sense? It does, but I've got to leave this on you. I've never done anything to, to compare and contrast those things. I've, I've always just used pollen patties to supplement brood production and pollen traps on those rare occasions when I thought I might want to trap some pollen for future use or whatever. I can quickly say if those pollen cakes had any natural pollen in them, they're much more attractive than just brewer's yeast or whatever was being used to bring the 
protein components together. But many researchers, some researchers, frequently researchers, give concerns about that because you can spread chalk brood and some other fungal and bacterial type diseases with, with contaminated pollen. So it's not not really something eagerly done, but I would readily trap my own pollen and then mix it with something and feed it back just because I would be more comfortable using my own pollen that's there anyway. So if there's a disease there, it's already there too. It's not like I'm getting someone else's disease and introducing it. So does that make sense? That makes perfect sense because that's what I do. I trap pollen, make pollen patty out of it, got them in the freezer if I need to feed uh, a colony because it's weak or, you know, for whatever reason, then I stick one of those on and a, and a sugar syrup feeder and get out of the way. Yep. I wasn't sure I was going to tell this story. I'll keep it short. Have you ever tasted royal jelly? That's a good question. I don't think so. Well, I just couldn't resist it. I mean, here's this stuff that makes the queen. So I took a sample of that. And I got to tell you, I didn't find it to be very appealing. It wasn't at all sweet or good. So if you're using honey as a measuring stick, no to royal jelly. So I was, of course, I had to sample a little pollen cake. I mean, it's not toxic, is it? I didn't, I didn't eat a whole pollen patty, but no, it wasn't very good either. <laughs> so I didn't add that to any menu item I had. But years ago, just like you were talking about, I trapped pollen, and there was beautiful rainbow colors of pollen there. It was all nice and fresh, and there were pounds of it. And I just took my hive tool and dipped up what I th probably a teaspoon, half a tablespoon or so, and popped that in my mouth. And my first thought was to spit it out. Now, I don't want to offend people who eat pollen and, and really enjoy it. I overdosed myself, I was told. But later on, I had a bit of an asthmatic reaction to that. So I never really added pollen to my human diet either, even though I know many other people have high protein source. All that kind of thing. Where is all this going? We have right now lots of ways to supplement that pollen flow, which is every bit as critical to the bees as the nectar flow. But I think it's remarkably different from the nectar flow. The way the bees collect it, how much collect it, how much they store, how they store it, the long-term use of it. They got to have it, but it is definitely not the same product as a nectar source supply coming in. You got that you've got that right. Exactly. And and it take you know, you just step back take a half a step back and and sort of visualize the nectar flows. Uh, and and some plants are heavy nec heavy nectar and no pollen, heavy nectar and lots of pollen, heavy pollen and almost no nectar. If you know your plants you can kind of tell what's going to be going on inside and maybe supplement it a little bit so that they don't get short of pollen or short of nectar. But I think we've worn this one out today. I, I know you've worn me out. <laughs> when, when we started this, I was thinking, you know, we'll discuss various ways that bees need pollen and protein, and we did. But it's just not neat and clean, is it? So it, when I began this discussion by saying that everybody loves the nectar flow, well, that's because the nectar flow is so lovable. You know, you got a honey crop coming. You can see whiting on the combs. You can see miraculous nectar appear seemingly almost overnight. And the only thing about a pollen flow is that you see a lot of bees coming and going at the entrance carrying pollen loads. And you see that band you talked about. And for most beekeepers, that's pretty much it. And I'm back to where I started. If you have a good pollen flow, I really like to see that because it probably means I'm going to have a, a good nectar flow that I really wanted to see. <laughs> so we kind of punched it out. I, I don't want to make recommendations on our podcast, Kim, but I do feed pollen patties, pollen cakes, and I do want to believe that it's helpful. Now, but just before we quit, for those of you who have Small high beetles. Kim, you mentioned that a bit ago. Sometimes those pollen cakes can really go a long way toward increasing small high beetle populations. And so if you leave them on long term, you may have to watch to that more than the rest of us who don't have big problems with small high beetles. I'll tell you a quick trick and then we can go about, about pollen patties and small high beetles. I put a pollen patty on top of a, of a strong hive and they don't much 
you know, they're not going to do much with it. They got pollen coming in. They got nectar coming in. They're raising kids. But the small hive beetles in that hive will find that pollen patty, and you come back in three or four days, and it's loaded with small hive beetle larvae. All right? You yeah, grab, you, yeah. grab, you grab that pollen patty and rush it over to the chicken coop and throw it in the chicken pen, and I've got the happiest chickens. They get pollen patty and small hive beetle larvae for lunch. <laughs> I have no, no, I have no response to that. I love the idea, but that implies that now I've got to have bees and chickens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you how to get some chickens next time, all right? Yeah, I'll just buy your old ones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the ones you've already got named and tamed. <laughs> all right. All right. I, I just wanted to defend the pollen flow for a while. It never gets its fair share because it always lives in the shadow of the nectar flow. Yep, yep. But without a pollen flow, the bees are not going to be able to do anything with a nectar flow. Exactly. You've got to have them. Exactly. Good We time. punched it out. We punched it out. I'm done. Okay. See you next time. All right. Thanks for talking. <laughs>